Okay, so before we begin, I would like to begin by honoring and acknowledging the offices of eCampus Ontario are located on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people are recognized and I am grateful for the legacy of all past, present, and future generations of the first peoples of this land. I invite you to share your own land acknowledgement and please use the link uh, Fraser will drop in the chat to learn more about the work of Indigenous Institute across Ontario. It is also Black History Month, so happy Black History Month uh, to everyone. Okay, so thanks again for joining us on this how to submit your final VLS or CVLP project webinar. I'll be starting with a quick overview of the submission process criteria and the submission guide. Then we'll watch a pre-recorded video put together by our um, Open Library Coordinator, Stephen, that walks you through the submission form. This demo will also be available on the submission page in the near future. Then our uh, Fraser from our PMO team has some updates on submitting your final VLS pro uh, reports. And then finally, we'll have some time to answer some questions not addressed in either the guide or the FAQ. So before I get started, I just want to mention again that this webinar is to demonstrate how to use the VLS submission form to upload your VLS deliverables and answer specific, uh, specific questions about using the submission form. As there are many projects with unique needs, please email vls at ecampusontario.ca if you have other questions that are outside of how to actually upload your submission. So the VLS collection submission form, it will be available or is scheduled to be available on February 14th. So I'll repeat, the VLS collection submission form is scheduled to be available on February 14th. You will receive an email once the form is open. All projects producing copyrightable content are obligated to submit their work by February 28, 2022. So the submission form will be open on February 14th and it will be closed or you're obligated to upload your submission by February 28th. Okay, so you're probably wondering how the submission process works. So we do have a detailed overview on the submission page. Uh, hopefully you have a chance to review the VLS collection website and has taken a look at the submission page, but I'll summarize those overviews in four steps here. Essentially, you know, the goal is to read the submission criteria and guide so that you're familiar with what you need to provide on the submission form, but also what you need to do for your actual um, uh, how to prepare your actual content. Once you've done that, you can complete the submission form. After that, allow up to 20 business days to catalog your resource. So again, we're dealing with a large number of submission all happening um, within you know, a, short a short time frame. So we just need some time to actually review the submission and process them. Once we've cataloged them, you'll receive a confirmation email with link to view your resource. So again, this is a a very sort of short overview step in um, that I've compressed. A lot of the extra detail in between each step is posted on the website. So things like what happens after you actually receive a confirmation email, and if there's sort of a correction that you need to report, or if you need to uh, send us an updated file version. So I encourage you to just read all of the actual the detail uh, submission process on the website. So we've put together a comprehensive guide that will help you prepare your VLS content for submission and leads you through the submission form as well. Each field is expanding on and we've provided examples and linked to resources when applicable. Please read the guide or consult the guide if you have any questions. And of course, follow up with us if your question is not answered as some of you have done already. So for the next following three slides, I will go over some of the required criteria for your content and some things we highly recommend, including with your submission. Again, these are all um, information that is on the website and also included in the guide. So your content must display licensing information, including any exceptions or copyright permission. Most content platforms or authoring tools include a metadata element to capture this information for you. Uh, for example, if you are using Pressbook, then you'll know that the book info section is where you can enter your licensing information, and then that then get display on the front end of your uh, Pressbook webbook. If not, simple licensing info on a cover page or somewhere visible is all you need. Really what you're trying to do is just make sure that 
the licensing detail of your resource is clearly visible for the end users um, to see. Please consult the website of your selected license on how to mark your work with that particular license. Depending on which license you're using, each license may have different uh, requirement or specific or template on how to actually mark your work with those licenses. We've included how to mark your work in the submission guide for those using the Ontario Common License. So consult the guide for the generic template on how to actually uh, mark your work with Ontario Common License. Depending on what you are creating and how you create it, you have obligations to meet specific accessibility requirements under AODA. So again, depending on what you're creating, there's different requirements under AODA in terms of what you need to include or what is considered accessible. So some example may include, you know, providing all text for images, um, adding access accessibility tags to PDF, adding caption to videos, and so forth. If you have an accessibility department at your institution, we highly encourage you to connect with them to find out what template they have available, whether they have a checklist or not. If you are using a platform that's designed to be accessible, it is still important to run your own accessibility checklist just to ensure the platform meets it all, especially if you add any custom coding. Again, those who are using Pressbook will know that Pressbook is meant to be accessible, but then if you add any custom coding, then you will know that you have to run your own check. But we still highly recommend just you know going through it as well, just to make sure that you've covered all of the requirements. You must also include the acknowledgement of provincial funding statement. You can find the exact wording in the guide. And finally, include editable files. So when we say editable, we really mean a digital file that a user can easily edit and change. It can also be transferred from one platform to another and can be accessed from different devices with the content still intact. This particular area is a little tricky, mainly because depending on what project you're actually working on and what you're producing, your output may be restricted to a specific tool or platforms. For example, XR, VR technology are very limited. So then depending on that, your editable file really just means that you're producing and providing a file that others, if they have to acquire that particular uh, software, can do so, it can upload it and edit it easily. Again, uh, please consult the submission guide for more information about editable files and why we ask for them and how to generate them or what the different examples are. And these are really, uh, and uh, for this uh, particular slide, these are really things that we highly recommend but are not required. So they certainly will increase the usability of your content. Um, for example, include an accessibility statement. So if you are already obligated to meet AODA um, accessibility, really the next natural step is to include an accessibility statement, just to wrap it all up in a nice package to show how and what you've done to make your resource accessible. And also what the limitations actually are. So that's where the accessibility statement can help with that. Depending on what platform you use, you may be able to generate an accessibility report that you can attach to your file. Um, you can conduct a third party accessibility review. This information will be tagged and labeled on your resource in our catalog. So you're required to be AODA accessible as almost all the institutions are now and all websites in Ontario. Accessibility statement, by including that, it allows us to tag your resource in the catalog so that it makes it easier for the end users to find your resource, knowing that you've gone above and beyond that extra uh, level to include a statement. Provide multiple file types. Essentially, we want every file type your platform application can export. The more formats you can provide to the end user, the easier it is to accommodate different needs. So some of this need may actually be accessibility needs. Other needs may just may be easy facilitation in terms of ability to use multiple devices or accommodate other needs. So supplementary or ancillary resources goes a long way to help others use your content as intended. For example, if you have a vision of how your resource is meant to be used, and I know some of you do because I'm meeting with some of you, um, include that in an instructor guide or a video. 
or maybe you have an assignment suggestions you want to share that goes along with the course, uh, with the course that you're putting together, or you want to start renewable assignments. Some projects are required to actually provide auxiliary resource. So this particular section is not for you. This is really just for those projects where you know, you want to provide and attach as much supplementary material as you can, if available, to help others use your work as intended. And if applicable, include a format that can be used to set up print-on-demand options. So we have a great print-on-demand partnership with University of Waterloo printing team. So if you're producing an open textbook, adapting open educational um, a type format, and if applicable, so meaning, will this resource make a nice printed version? We recommend providing that PDF print format. If this is something that you are interested in now, or even after you submit your resource, you can connect with us and then we can sort of uh, help you figure out how to create a uh, print on demand file type of your resource. And lastly, include a cover image. So. Covers goes a long way. We do judge a book by its cover, and we also judge things on the internet by how they look. So we highly recommend including a cover image whenever you can. If you have a video or um, you know an image type, consider a poster image whenever you can, just to you know entice and make your resource more. Um, uh, presentable. Again, these are highly recommended because we know that they do add value to your resource, but they're not required. Okay, and finally, a quick note about uploading your file and size. On the submission form, you can add the URL for your resource. You can also add URL to upload um, uh, a link to a cloud storage as well. You can um, upload primary or additional files. So this particular part is important. So the maximum upload file we would like you to aim for is two gigabytes. So I mentioned aim for because that's actually true. And, a, and there's a reason for why we want you to aim for two gigabyte. So one of the reasons really is just making it easier for others to download your resource in the end. So some of the things you can do to help reduce the size of your file is to zip or compress your file. Even better if cloud storage is an option. So Google Drive, OneDrive, or if your institution has a drive that you can send us and have it open for a certain amount of time, those options, uh, if they're available, would be great. However, we understand depending on your project, two gigabyte, even after compression, is impossible. So I know that uh, we've uh, uh, heard from some of you with your project working on you know, certain um, extended reality where it's just impossible to compress or have that video be two gigabyte, please connect with us if you haven't done so already for an agree upon alternative. The reason why we're asking that you just connect with us first is really so that we understand what to expect so that we also know how to reach out to you if there are any issues. Uh, we And also that we're actually able to open the file to review it before adding it to the catalog so that if the end user has issues opening the file, we're able to address that. So again, it's really more about just having that open communication channel so that we know what to expect so that if there's any issues, we can reach back out to you. So as I've mentioned, I think most of you have reached out to us already who are submitting a file that's larger than two gigabyte. If you haven't done so, just send us an email and then we can just you know figure something out. If using a cloud storage is not an option or if compressing or zipping the file is still above uh, two gigabyte. So that briefly covers um, all of the required criteria, things to consider including with your submission, which then brings us to our actual demo, what it looks like if you were submitting the project. So before I play the file, uh, the video, what I'm going to mention is that, um, so as I said, this session is primarily VLS, but it's also for those who are working on CVLP project. So when you watch the demo, you'll notice that the first part of the actual submission form is asking for your VLS ID, sorry, your VLS project details. The submission form is the exact same replica 
for CVLP projects. The only difference is that for CVLP project, you're only going to be asked to provide your CVLP project ID. So the actual top part of the VLS uh, project detail will not be visible for CVLP projects. So I'll repeat that again after we watch the demo. That way it makes, um, makes sense. Absent submission demo. My name is Stephen Wilfield, and I'm the Open Library Coordinator for eCampus Ontario. In this video, I will be demonstrating how to submit your VLS project. An email will be sent to you with a direct link once it is available, but you can also access the form on the VLS collection website. Before submitting, before completing the submission form, please read the criteria and the submission guide for further instructions and assistance. Simply scroll to find the submission form. For the purpose of this demo, I'm going to use Essentials of Linguistics as my resource. So you're going to start by entering your VLS project ID. So in my case, it's ALGM-1016. This is the unique number that is associated with your VLS project. If you type the number incorrectly, as you can see here, uh, a red message will appear warning you that your VLS project ID is incorrect. This will allow you to double check that you are entering the correct ID. So I will go back and fix that. After your VLS project ID is correct, then you will select the category from the drop-down list. This is the project category that you selected in your EOI. So click creating a new online course. Once you select your VLS project category, please answer whether you're supported by CVLP by clicking yes or no. If you click no, you can move on to the next section. If you click yes, you will be asked to provide the name of the vendor or vendors that you used. So as you can see, if you click no, you can move on. If you click yes, you must enter the name of the vendor or vendors that you used. The next section will capture your information as the person submitting the VLS project. Please enter your first name, last name, and institutional email. So this is, in my case, this is, this is mine. Once you have entered your information, you, you will go to the next section where you provide details about your resource. Please note that not all of the fields are required to submit the project. For the fields that are not marked with an asterisk, please answer them if they're relevant for your resource. So you're going to enter the title of your resource. So in this case, it is Essentials of Linguistics, followed by any the author or authors of your, of your source. If you have more than one author, you can click Add to add as many as, as you need, as many authors as, as you have in your resource. So th these next few fields are not required, but, but if your resource has this information, please make sure that it is captured in these boxes. So the first one is editor. So this is the person or organization who compiled and or revised your, your, the resource and other contributors. So these, this is a person or a organization that helped create this resource, but is not an editor or, or an author. So some examples include instructional designers, translators. Next, you're going to enter the primary contact email for the resource if, if, if it's other than yourself. Ideally, this would be the person who can answer any questions about and or update the content of the resource itself. So you'll then insert the publisher, the name of the publisher, if, it, if you have a publisher for this resource. If the publisher is, with, is a department within an institution, enter the name of the institution after the department, separating the names with a comma. So open education lab comma ontario tech university you will you will next enter the publication date you you can select please 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 note that only the year is mandatory however providing full publication dates when when available are important to helping users sort resources by date more accurately if you're unsure of the publication date, please just enter the date that you're filling up this form. So in this case, today is February 7th, 2022. After inserting the publication date, you, you, can, you will select the primary language of your resource from the drop-down list here. 
If your language is not listed here, please select other. Other, select not applicable if your project is an image or, or numerical data. Select English. Next, if applicable, indicate whether your resource is an adaption, remix, or derivative of another resource, either in the eCampus Ontario Open Library or elsewhere. For example, you should complete this field if your VLS project category is adapt an existing open educational resource or create course shell to an existing open course. If applicable, click yes and provide the URL or URLs of the original resource or resources. Either enter one per line if you have more than, than one, one source. So if you hit no or unsure, you will move on. If it yes, then you will be asked to enter a website or URL of, of any related sources. Select the education level of your resource from the drop down menu. This is meant to capture the target audience of learners or educators within the Canadian post secondary system. If you have any questions about this, please refer to the VLS submission guide. You will then be asked to select the learning resource type from the drop down menu. So, in, with this one, you can choose multiple options here. And if you have any questions, once again, please refer to the VLS submission guide. So, I will choose reference material and textbook. Next, Box Zero will provide a brief description or abstract for your project. This will appear on the Open Library Catalog and is meant to guide users in selecting the materials that meet their needs. Please note that the character limit for this is set at 3000. So I, I have a description ready to go and I will copy and paste that there. After entering your description, you will be asked about the subject of your resource. As, as with the learning resource type, you have the option to uh, choosing multiple choices that best describe your resource. We select up to three categories. So I will select under humanities, language and linguistics and under social sciences, law and legal studies. You will, you will then insert any keywords, any keywords that you have. These will help users find what they're looking for and organize your resource into the appropriate categories. Please note that you can only add three keywords and you can, you can also include hashtags. If you're using hashtag, please use camel case. To enter more than one keyword, separate the words with a comma and capitalize the first letter for each keyword. So I have three keywords available here. So phonology, semantics, and hashtag morphology. You will then have the option to report any accessibility statements that you may have for your resource. If you click no or unknown, you'll be able to proceed to the next section. However, if you click yes, you'll be asked to attach a URL to the accessibility review. If the review is not available via URL, you can, you can upload any files to the additional files section below. So as you see here, if I unknown, no, you can move on. But if you hit yes, you will be asked to insert a URL. You, you will now be asked to, to link your project's URL if it's applicable or add any additional files that you may have for your resource. These additional files can include a resource cover, print-on-demand files, or external peer reviews. If you're unsure, you should upload a file. If you're at, or if you have any questions about your files, please refer to the VLS submission guide. The on screen here is a list of supported file types that, that you may upload into this section. Next, you, you will insert the, the resource license type from, from the drop down menu under a license here. If, the, if your license type does not appear on your list, on this list, please select other. Use this traditional knowledge label field if your resource contains any traditional knowledge labels. This next section is all about making sure that your resource is discoverable. If you have this information, please provide it as it allows your resources to be found more easily. These extra fields include the DOI and ISDN. And a note, multiple ISDNs can be added, but they must be separated by commas. And if anybody on your team has an ORCID ID, please put that here. If you have multiple people with ORCID IDs, you could 
click add to add more than one. If a person or an organization other than the author or authors owns and manages the rights to your resource, please specify that here. You will, you will then be asked uh, if the resource is part of a series. To click yes, you'll be asked to link to the other resources in the series. Please note that clicking add will allow you to enter more than one resource. It, you will then be asked if your if your resource has an external peer review or post publication peer review available for this resource. Again, if you hit yes, you will be asked to provide a URL or a website for this for this review. Finally, finally, you will be asked if your resource is part, is tied to a specific course, module, program, or micro credential. If you answer yes to this question, you will be asked to provide the name of the institution and the name of the course. Please note that this is a required field. Uh, so if the answer to the if the answer to the above question is yes, then you will have to provide the name of the course and the institution. So with that, uh, please take a minute to review your answers. And if you have any if you have any questions, please reach out to the eCampus Ontario team or consult the VLS submission guide. And you can go ahead and hit submit and your your VLS mission will be complete. Okay, everyone. Thank Over you. the past oh. four years, I spent oh, sorry, $40 million dollars on Facebook. <laughs> Forgot to uh, the rule of closing the window when you're done. Let me just put that. Okay. Hey. Yeah, so thank you everyone for uh, uh, watching that demo video done by Steven. And uh, I, I was looking at the chat while, while we were playing the video. I was trying not to respond because I didn't want the, uh, my typing to um, go over the sound. But yes, this video will be available and we will send it out to everyone and it will be posted on the website as well as this uh, webinar uh, session. So as I've mentioned er uh, before we started playing the, uh, the demo video, for those who are uploading CVLP projects, the top portion that asks for the uh, VLS project details will not be on the actual form. So we're just going to be asking for the CVLP project ID. Welcome to the... Find my way back. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to turn the floor over to Fraser to give us an update on the VLS final report. Uh, thanks, Rama. I had a little bit prepared, but I'm just going to jump in before that and uh, so tell everybody that uh, I will do my best to um, facilitate uh, the Q and A session by going through the questions that have been asked in the chat. I do ask to uh, help me with that that you don't repost the question um that has been uh, posted uh to help me cut down on some of the ones that i have to read to get through it uh so just a quick reminder that this is about uh, the vls submission form and a demonstration um we do direct you to the vls inbox with questions more specific to your project uh however um the, the volume there is quite um uh, quite a lot of volume at the moment and we are piling through it as quick as we can and with the VLS report submission deadline that we just passed through, we are playing a bit of catch up, so we do apologize. Um, so I do wanna talk now a little bit about VLS final reports. This is a little bit of a VLS team public service announcement, if you will. Uh, there's been a lot of questions and we'd like to address them now um, about the reports and the format and what they will be done. Um, VLS uh, format final reports will be the same format and workflow as you've seen in your previous quarterly reports. So no need to make a net new report. We will open the reports um, through the reporting portal as we have in the past. Um, the report financial status, remember that your goal is always to show a variance of zero. Uh, any unspent funds on the project will need to be returned to eCampus Ontario after the fact and the process for that is in place and will involve um, a few emails back and forth at the end. A reminder that final reports must be completed by March 11th. They will be made available in the first week of March. Um, 
and will be uh, called out in an email. Uh, while I'm speaking to emails very quickly, the emails that we send out are sent to the project contact list that we have from your original EOIs or have been updated throughout the course of the project. So if you're not receiving emails, um, please A, check that your junk mail filter is uh, not capturing them, uh, B, that your institution is allowing them through their main filter, and finally, check your EOI as to who is listed as the project contact. Uh, they may be receiving emails. Uh, and finally, the theme of the reports will be confirming, uh, confirming outcomes and outputs, depending on the category, collaborators, lessons learned, and your final financial status. Um, the VLS collection submission form is scheduled to be available on the 14th of February. Uh, you will receive an email once the form is open. Uh, all projects producing copyrightable content are obligated to submit by February 28th. Um, and that's uh, all that I have for you at this point. Okay, thank you for that uh, update, Frazier. So we are now ready for the question period. And this is where please bear with us as we play catch up. So I've been trying to read the questions in the chat to kind of summarize them so that I can answer uh, multiple questions. What I want to do first is I'm going to start with the um, questions in the Q&A and then we can move on to questions in the chat. Let's see. So the, Fraser, do you mind reading out the questions? Uh, no, not at all. So the first question was, uh, who will receive the emails? I believe we've addressed that one, hopefully. Um, the second question is, can we keep updating the modules after we've submitted, or is the module essentially frozen? And Rama, what I would like to do here mm -hmm. is post in the link um, the section about updating files. Uh, oh, it's not posting the link properly. So I will uh, come back to that one right now. But I will post it, post in the link and post in the chat about updating files. Correct. So I'll answer it live just to summarize what it'll say in the guide. So once you submit your resource to the uh, open library, you can update your modules after you submit it. But again, you I think it's important to recognize and, and realize that when you put a license on the work and you submit it, it is considered published. So any updates that you make, you would just need to notify us about it and then we can update your module as needed. But keeping in mind that when is added to the catalog is also available for others to use and download. So that's just something that um, I wanted to mention because I know that question was asked a few times in the chat, but Fraser will add the link to the guide and we'll have more sort of procedures set up in terms of how to actually submit and notify us that you've made an update to an existing resource in our catalog. Thank you, Rama. We have, we have one here and I'm going to bundle this. I'm going to do a bundle here because uh, I've saw, seen it in this. I've seen it in the chat. For an articulate storyline project, do we submit the articulate file or just the output, i.e. scrum, scrum, scrum file, which Rama knows I have trouble saying sometimes. Uh, and I'd like to follow that up with, there was questions about publishing of impress books. And if they've published impress books, do they still need to submit? as well as if they published in the eCampus Ontario environments, uh, did they just need, do they still need to submit and is just copying, the, including the link uh, considered to be good enough? Okay, so for all the LS uh, project, which is different than those who are actually familiar with the open library submission form and process is different. So for the VLS project, you must add and include the URL to your resource, especially if it's an OER, so that we can link to the actual online version, but you must also upload the files because part of it is that under the VLS project uh, requirements, you were required to actually provide all editable files for videos and images that weren't uploaded directly into Pressbook. So that's something that's very different for those who are familiar with the open library submission process. So yes, you do need to use a submission form, include the URL, but also upload any files that were created as part of your VLS project. So this doesn't refer to videos that you're linking to that are created by other 
um, other creators, but actual video that you've created yourself as part of the VLS project, you must upload mp4.mov. So some type of actual media file has to be uploaded along with those uh, with those submission. For a particular storyline, yes. So again, we want as many format as you can export. So Articulate will let you export many different types of file format. Give us all of it because again, we want to facilitate and ease those who may not have Articulate, but may be able to use a Scrum file, right? But those who also have Articulate may find that they rather just use the Articulate file because it's a lot easier. The more you give us, the easier it is for the end user to use it in different platform and different ways. So hopefully that um, answers that question. Uh, Rama, there's a few follow-ups that have come through on the chat related to that question. Um, in particular, if I have 90 videos in YouTube, I have to upload all 90 videos? Yes. If it's created as part of VLS, it has to be. So that was required in the EOI um, because, again, URLs can die. Uh, sorry, URLs can become dead links. So if you are linking to your resource in Pressbook, then the issue becomes then how can how and especially if your life if you're picking a license that allow others to edit or modify or adapt your resources, then they need to be able to do that in a reliable uh, method. If you've created a lot of videos, uh, we will connect with us and then we'll figure out sort of an easier way to uh, to get all of those files. Okay, this this is causing a bit of a consternation in the chat. So I'm going to ask people if they have specific video questions um, in the next in the next week or so to email them to us, um, and and we will address them uh, at that point in time. Um, Rama, can we create our own accessibility statement, or should some kind of standard be used? Yeah, so you can create your own. So in the guide, I've provided examples um, and toolkits. So BC Campus has a great tool, accessibility toolkit, and I believe Ryerson University also has a great one. Um, and we've also included examples and linked to WCAG website in terms of how to create one. Um, it's certainly up to you. So there are sort of templates that you can use, but you can also just uh, create your own. There is a format to it. So meaning if you are creating your own, there's sort of a format of what accessibility statements should include um, as well. And again, if you have an accessibility resource at your institution, please connect with them because oftentimes these are things that are required under AODA that all institutions, post-secondary education need to provide and have. So you may already have this resource available at your institution. Excellent. Um, is there any option, Rama, to make additional ancillary resources like test questions available only upon request? Yes. So all test banks are all instructor only guide, like question banks, test bank are always um, only available upon request. So those will not be posted publicly on the website. So what we do is we just refer to them and we provide a link so that those who are actually looking for them are able to uh, message us that they are able to request uh, the test bank essentially. So we do check and validate that they are an educator before providing those test banks. So that's, um, so yes, to answer that question. Uh, is it possible, oops, sorry. Is it, is it possible to have multiple submissions per project? Uh, for example, we have three separate press books as the outcome of our project. Is it, submiss is it possible to submit three forms to provide the required information for each press book separately? Absolutely. And then this, sorry, and Rama, this also raises a question of if I'm, if multiple uploads in one submission form, does the two gigabyte limit apply to the individual files or to the entire submission form? Okay. So the first part of the question, yes. So we do actually encourage you and want you to submit per resource. So meaning, think about it the way the resource itself will be displayed on the actual, uh, in the catalog, right? So if you are working with, let's say one VLS project ID, so you can enter that ID as an ID number as many times as needed, but if your output is actually three separate Pressbook uh, projects or three separate uh, Pressbook resources, then yes, you can use the submission uh, multiple times to capture those different resource titles, uh, those who work on it and all the other information that are different. So 
yes, to answer that part. The file upload is for all of it, but again, two gigabyte is the prefer upload size. So I do wanna emphasize that part. So we said maximum because really what we're trying to do is just getting you to think about how others will be able to actually access and download your resource in the end, right? So that's, you know, so it's a, it's a highly recommended suggested maximum upload uh, file size. Hopefully that answers that question. Thank you. Um, after the upload is in the library as a resource by February 28th, how often can we update that file and change um, throughout the year? Uh, uh, sorry, how often can we update that file if changes are made throughout the year and have updated and be updated in the library? Okay, so again, this uh, question, I highly recommend uh, reviewing the guide. We've linked to a great resource that's about um, correction, uh, addition and adaptation. So knowing that once you submit your resource and you add a license and it's in the catalog, so once you receive that confirmation email, you just want to think about how often you are updating your resource because it means that whatever version we have in the collection is actually being used by others and is accessible by others. So you, so you want to think about when you are updating your resource, um, just thinking about how often you do it can impact those who may be using your resource already. So for us, we always welcome and always want to provide the latest updated version. So we're never going to say don't send us don't send us updated version, but we just want you to think about that once you receive a confirmation email and you have a link to your resource in the catalog, that resource is live and is being used. you <clears throat> sorry excuse me and i'm just scrolling down um i'm actually um i have a live question from patrick while i'm trying to catch up um patrick i'm going to allow you to talk sweet <laughs> <laughs> but don't forget patrick i do have control of the mute button <laughs> okay I, I will be careful um i um i was just wondering you know, my project scope has expanded and changed directions a little bit, but it does include the original scope as well. And I, I, when I submit the form, um, am I better to include the original title and the original description that was approved, or should I include the description in the title of the full scope? Yeah, so oh, that's a great question. And I think you may not actually be the only one who uh, this has happened, because I know I've re we've received email questions about that. So. If the scope of your project has changed, the title has changed, that's fine. You So what we actually want is the most recent uh, title of your resource. So when you are submitting your, um, your project, we want whatever is the current title and current uh, description. And this is why we collect the VLS uh, project ID because the project ID allows us to have that control uh, connection, right? Which is separate from actual titles that you want. So I know for a fact, most projects have changed their title as is um, natural when you're actually creating something. So that's fine. So you will go with whatever is the most recent title and scope uh, or description of your uh, project. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Um, Rama, I, I just want to, we're having a lot of questions that seem to harken back around licensing and license <laughs> applications uh, in that area. And what I would like to do at this point in time is I'm gonna, I've posted in the chat, the vls.ecampusontario.ca vls-1, which if you scroll down that page, um, will link you to the original webinars on licensing, mm -hmm. the, um, VL, the VLS, uh, sorry, internally we call it 1.0, VLS first round um, FAQ, frequently asked questions. And a lot of these questions that we're getting are addressed in those documents. I'm also going to, um, I posted earlier on, and I will repost them again here, the VLS um, uh, collection site, mm -hmm. um, sorry, the VLS collection submission guide, um, which I will post again. Uh, which we encourage people to to review uh, before sending their questions to the inbox. And then also the VLS uh, submission site, which contains uh, the FA, uh, VLS submission site FAQ that you prepared um, that, uh, that, that was created uh, by your team to address some of the higher level questions. So just might be a helpful resource for everybody 
uh, on the submission site. So, um, uh, so back to the back to our regularly scheduled questioning program. Uh, the submission bot guide does not list all file submission types, but it did appear briefly in the video in the attached file pop up. Are these listed somewhere? They they are listed on the submission form. So once the submission form uh, opens on the week of both week of the 14 hopefully the 14 they will be listed there so you'll be able to view them i can assure you that we've captured almost all of the file types so there's really uh between you know if you're providing a url to a cloud storage so that would be the url to the cloud storage but then if you're uploading file it accepts all commonly typed files and we did make sure to look at the scope of the project or different sort of conversation we've had with those who are working on different type of file format so you can upload them and again if you're compressing or zipping you can also upload those but that uh, particular file description will be available um, on the submission form. So you'll be able to click on it and it will give you the full list of the different file type. Thank you, Rama. Um, we're receiving a, a lot of questions around the VLS project, um, closing statement or closing report, final report, final submissions. Once again, everybody, please, I wanna direct you to the VLS uh, website to look at that information. Yes, the project is concluded by the 31st, which means your funds must be spent and indicated by spent as being spent by the end of your report on March 11th. So in other words, when you file your report March 11th, you should predict how many funds, you, how much your funds will be spent by that point in time, um, which should be a variance of zero. So you should have no money left in your project budget. If your project is run, if you're running over, uh, there are the VLS project, if you're running over funds um, and you need, there are no funds to continue with your VLS project, sorry, no funds available to continue your VLS project um, beyond the end of March. They, you can apply it through another program uh, if needed, but uh, the VLS first round funding is closed as of March 1st. Um, so now back to the live questions again. Um, so and Patrick Patrick's just read a question. So folks, if you think of it as your final report, sorry, I just said folks, you can all make fun of me for that. Um, if you think of your final report, it's a bit of a pre-submission. If you submitted on the 31st, the window wouldn't be available to process the report for the 31st. So you're really on the 11th, by the 11th, you're you're you are um, on the 11th, you are providing a report. That will detail the end of your pro up to the end of your project on the thirty first. And uh, Rosie's just posted some helpful helpful information in the chat. Um, sorry, everybody. sorry, Fraser. Can I just yes. I just be very clear here? You say the thirty first of March, right? Not of February. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. March. <laughs> sorry. Yes, of March. March. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we we detail the report up until the eleventh, predicting what will happen by the thirty first of March. Yes, Patrick, you put that way more eloquently than I did, but yes. Thank you. It's exactly. just because I keep seeing questions. And I want to make sure we're crystal clear. Thank you. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Uh, I, Patrick, I appreciate you helping me uh, clear that up, actually. That was, that was fantastic. Um, so we have about eight minutes left, and I think I want to re re reiterate uh, one of the answers to a question that I saw coming up multiple times, just about whether you can submit just a URL. So again, emphasizing the part that as part of the VLS project, you are required to submit editable files of your resource. So URLs, if you are linking out to a URL, if it's a URL where we can download actual editable files, that is acceptable. So again, if, for example, that would be if you were using a cloud storage, so you're linking out to the cloud storage, we can go and actually download the files, that's uh, acceptable. So this will be the same for those who are creating courses in LMS. So you will have to export the common cartridge as that's, that was the required file type suggested in the original EOI. So we you would need to link, sorry, you would need to upload the common cartridge file and any other export file type you can actually get out of the um, LMS, we would love to have. But the minimum requirement for courses was common cartridge, unless, you know, we've included um, articulate and other type of platform, depending on what project you were working on. But I just wanted to emphasize that part about making sure that the submission includes not just the URL to the actual resource as live, but also 
editable file itself that we can enable download option for others. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Fraser. I just wanted to uh, emphasize that part. You no, know, I appreciate that, Rama. And I'm just wondering if there's, uh, in the last five minutes, if there's any fine points that you would like to, um, any final point, any, any other points that you want to review and quick. And then I will invite uh, our last chance for live questions. If anybody has any live questions that they would like to come on, come online and, and make. Um, let's do live question if possible, Perfect. but also encouraging folks that if your question has not been answered, please consult the guide, uh, you know, the website, but also email us as well, because we do want to answer your question. It's just that a lot of the time, the questions are very specific to your project, or they've already been answered in previous FAQ, or they're answered in the guide. So, um, but yeah, if anybody wants to uh, have a final Perfect. live question. I have uh, three live questions uh, in the queue right now. We'll go Barry, Patrick, and Teresa, and we'll start with Barry. Hi, Barry. Hi, Fraser. How are you? Good, thank you. Uh, quick question. Um, I have done a suite of six courses with two other colleges. Um, I'm assuming that we can upload them all with the appropriate authors and, and uh, sponsoring college. But I'm wondering in terms of the catalog, if, is it enough to put a statement in each, the beginning of each course that the courses are part of a, a grouping? I'm not quite visualizing how they'll be displayed. If we you know, call them a common with a common title uh, and then course one, course two like that. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question. So it depends on how you, like it, one, it depends on what system you've used and how you're going to um, upload them. From our end, when you tell us, um, uh, like when we look at the detail on the actual course itself, right? We will list all the institutions that was involved. And from the user standpoint in the catalog, you'll be, people, folks will be able to actually search by the institution. So that's something that will be labeled in our catalog itself, but it's important that that information is displayed on the resource itself so that we can capture that. Yeah, so and if we answer. use a common hashed, a common keyword, we should be fine. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. And just to add to uh, that, um, again, you will have opportunity to review your resource as it will appear in the catalog. So we always encourage you to get back to us if you want um, a certain feel display a certain way, or if some information become available that wasn't available at the time you were submitted. So I just want to um, emphasize that part as well. Perfect. So with four minutes left, I'm going to go to Patrick Mahar, followed by Teresa, followed by Tom. Patrick Mahar. Great. Thanks. Um, my question was just about capacity grants because it's come up a couple of times in the chat. And because those were targeted supports, they don't really have the same content-based connection that you've just shown us in the uh, in the in the submission process. So, what do we do with those? Yeah. So, for those uh, projects, if you you weren't necessarily required to up, uh, to submit a content, but if you actually have something you want to share and make available, you can use the open library submission form, which will be available shortly after the VLS uh, form. So, you know, we encourage and want those uh, files that if you have, if you want to share them, it just means that you will be using a different submission form because it wasn't a requirement under VLS. Okay, great. So we have nothing we need to do for February 28th for the targeted capacity grants. Correct. Correct. Okay. I believe there was only two categories of those uh, that were actually producing uh, an actual copyrightable content. But for those that were um, obligated to actually upload anything, you don't need to use the submission form. The submission form will look the same. Again, just the VLS category detail, uh, project detail will not be visible. Right. It was great that you're here to see what it looks like. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Patrick, thanks for raising that question because it's kind of, it's, you did see in the chat a couple of times. So uh, I encourage people to refer to your original submission EOI mm -hmm. to help clarify what, what uh, your expectations you've laid out for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but perfect. So thank you, Patrick. Teresa, um, Teresa Chan. Hello. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first question I had was um, just about the accessibility stuff. Is there a specific kind of certificate or do you want a letter? Because I wasn't sure what 
like why we would have a URL to an accessibility statement? Like, is it that you would want us to like upload a PDF somewhere and then link to it? That was confusing to me um, in the type of file submission. Um, and then the second question I had was um, like, if we're converting something from another digital resource and the copyright exists previously in that format, then um, like, do you just want us to give every single URL? Like I have a web page that I've been working with a blog where they have a whole bunch of resources that we've been converting. Um, and so would we link to, do you want a list of like a hundred, nearly a hundred URLs or do you want the website? Like a website that has all the URLs. Okay, so with the one minute we have, I can answer the first part of your question easily. The second part, requires a bit more understanding um, on that part. So I encourage you to email us about that second part of the question. But for the first part, so for the, so remember again, accessibility statement is not required, is highly recommended. So meaning under AODA, you need to meet certain accessibility requirements. So all project must meet that. The accessibility statement is a bonus. So the URL is actually, so generally what tends to happen is if you create a resource, or let's say you created a web page, a web book, your accessibility statement tend to be at the front of your um, page itself. So it tend to be in the front matter of the resource that you've created. That's the URL that you would actually be providing. Got it. Okay, yeah, so, yeah, so that's the URL you would be providing. You could also upload the file itself. So maybe you want to actually have it as a PDF, you can do that. So some who are creating resource, it's a PDF. A PDF, if you have Acrobat, will allow you to add accessibility report. So that report you can upload. So it's just different um, options available in terms of how or where the accessibility um, statement is. But I encourage you to check the guide because in the guide, we actually put examples and then we link to what it actually can look like as an example if you want to add one to your resource. Thank you. And just one more really, really quick question, which is if we mess something up because it, you can't save it, and I can't email you and then come back. Let's say I messed up on something. I assume your team will get back to us and say, you messed up on this. Can you resubmit this? Absolutely. So we we will connect with you if there is you know, something missing. Because we'll look at the resource, look at what you've input, just to make sure all the information is correct, names are spelled right. We will reach out if we're missing something, we can't open a file, or there's just any issue. And you're also encouraged to reach out to us again. If you find that you, oh, no, I forgot to include this, or, oh, we sent the wrong, we uploaded the wrong file just send us an email. So it's an open communication when it comes to making sure that we, you know, upload your resource the way it's supposed to be. And you'll have that opportunity to review it before, you know, it says, okay, we're all good to go. So we encourage, encourage you to connect with us. So that I believe it's the time. So, so I have one more question from Tom. Oh, and I'd like, he's been patiently waiting. So I'd like to, to let Tom come in here. That is there you go, Tom. Yes, thank you. Okay, so yeah, my question is just about the submission portal. Um, so we created a virtual gaming simulation in Affinity uh, mm -hmm. Learning, and so it's it has many many videos, but they're all in, in a singular you know software platform. And so as far as submission, uh, from what I'm hearing is I can include the link, but are you also asking that you know we download each and every one of those videos and attach them because they won't really be of much use for someone you know because they don't. They're not, they're not existing in a vacuum. They're existing as part of an entire branch branching, you know, simulation. So, yeah, so for anything like that, you still have to upload the file, mainly because we never know how others will use the resource later on, because it all goes back to the licensing, right? So if your licensing is allowed for adaptation, allows for remixing, then you should include and upload the uh, the file itself. Yes, it may mean that you know the person who wants to use it have to actually purchase or download the software, but that's up to the person itself. So we we want the URL. The URL will be front and center because you want people to see how it actually works. But then you want to upload the actual file from the system, mainly because to assist those who are actually interested in adapting, modifying, or remixing that file itself. And this goes for all type of projects. So depending on, again, what project you're using, because some projects are very new and innovative, 
we still want you to submit and upload the file because we want to encourage others to explore those files in those system or software. Hopefully that answers the question. Yes, wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Rama. Um, and Rama, I'll give you the last word, but just before I do, I wanna to say to everybody who's on the call, who's been able to stay on the call, on behalf of the VLS team, um, the, the PMO and the VLS team, I wanna thank you very, very much for uh, a great year and for um, your, your patience and your time. And please continue as we move through. Uh, you know, we're all in a, in a certain degree uh, learning as we go on how to make this the best we can and iteratively improving it through, through into VLS 2.0. Um, so we will, we do monitor the VLS inbox every day. We do uh, try to address it um, on a daily basis, uh, on an ongoing daily basis. And uh, we do encourage you um, to, to, to continue to respond. You will have between the 14th as planned right now and the 28th upload. So that's a good 12, 14 day window uh, to keep, to, to get things done. So. Yeah, I think just to echo what uh, Fraser said, thank you everyone for attending this webinar. We hope it was informative and it helped ease some of the um, you know stress or tension that may be around uploading your files. So again, I encourage you to uh, read the submission guide because a lot of the questions I've seen in the chat are answered in the guide. And if you know if you're still not sure about the answer, then feel free to uh, to email us again. So we're always happy, as you've known, for those who've reached out before, we're always happy to answer your questions. So I continue to do the same. Hey, have a great afternoon, everyone. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much. And thanks to Stephen for voicing the video for us.